our guests tonight and Valor students for chapel tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. He's the executive vice president of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference. He's an active member of the Washington community where he serves as a member of the president's evangelical advisory board. More than anything, he's a man who hears from God and has a word in his heart and in his mouth for us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome back to the platform at World Harvest Church, Tony Suarez. Would you lift up the name of Jesus like, like you know how to do tonight? Would you praise him like you know he already healed you, delivered you, did the miracle, and set you free? Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I'm so thankful to be back with you and to be back with the one and only, the general, the Prince of Preachers, Pastor Rod Parsley. How many love your pastor? And I love, I love this house because even though I'm from somewhere else, this house has been very important to me. I was healed right here at a camp meeting three years ago after a tumultuous time in my life. I was restored, renewed, and knocked out in the Holy Ghost right here. And then when I didn't know what was next, God spoke a word of prophecy me right there to me in this altar. So when I come to World Harvest, I come with expectation because good stuff always happens to me. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what your testimony is, but good stuff always happens to me. I've never left here without a blessing. I've never left here without a miracle. I've never left here without a word of prophecy. And I believe that tonight, before you leave, that's going to be your testimony. That's going to be your... Does anybody believe that you're going to leave here? with something in your hands and in your heart that's going to change the next five years of your life. If you believe it, I wish you'd shout. I wish you'd give God praise like you already got the word, you already got the miracle, you already got the... I'm going to go ahead and do it for me right now. Father, I thank you for what you're about to do for my life for my wife, for my family, for my children, because of this God-ordained, Holy Ghost-appointed time. I give you the praise. Come on, shout and give them praise. Hey. I have a, a mentor named Morton Bustard, which by the way, before I talk about him, Pastor Sam said, Pastor Sam Rodriguez, you know him, right? Okay, I figured. He said, you can't come to World Harvest Church and not tell them that I think they, I'm not supposed to say it to everyone else, but he said, outside of the church I pastor, he said, tell World Harvest they are my absolute favorite church to preach at. He said, you tell Pastor Parsley I love him. So Pastor Sam says hello. I have a mentor named Morton Bustard who taught me the gifts of the Spirit, taught me about supernatural ministry, and he said there was, and he always taught me there was two things about ministry. He said, number, two, number one, Jesus is a gentleman. It means he'll never embarrass anybody. If anybody ever comes to you in the name of God and it embarrasses you, it was not of the Lord. Number two, he said, you don't have to jazz up Jesus. That means you don't have to exaggerate him. You don't have to puff him up. He's already good enough, big enough, all on his own. And I believe in the word of prophecy. I believe in the word of wisdom. And I believe in the word of knowledge. But I'm going to tell you something. I, and, and I don't play with it. I don't say, thus saith the Lord, unless thus saith the Lord. If I'm not sure that it's God, I'll say, I think, I feel, I sense. But if it's God, I say, thus saith the Lord. And now, in any of the years that I've had a relationship with Pastor Parsley, has it ever occurred to me, nor have I had the courage to call the Prince of Preachers, the pastor, the general, who's had everybody and their mother preach behind that pulpit and say, Pastor, thus saith the Lord. But a week and a half ago, I was sitting about 5.30 in the morning in my living room, getting ready for that day, 5.30 in the morning, not because I'm super spiritual. I just wake up before my kids wake up so I can have a little peace and quiet with my coffee because I like my coffee in silence. Hallelujah. 
I like to hear nothing. Not the dog. I, lo oh, I like to hear my wife. I love you. But I don't like to hear anything else. And at 5.30 in the morning, the Lord spoke to me and gave me a word. And I didn't call pastor at 5.30 in the morning. I waited till later in the morning. But I called and I said, Pastor, I've never done this. I can't believe I'm about to do this. But Pastor... Thus saith the Lord for World Harvest Church, for Valor Christian College, for Harvest Television, and for everything connected to this house. And I gave him the word, not to come preach, I just gave him the word, and then he texted and he said, you need to come preach that word. I said, that's not why I gave you the word. He said, I don't care, that's a God word, and you gotta be here next Wednesday. So thus, I am here tonight to deliver what I believe is thus saith the word of the Lord. Amen. Father, I thank you for what you're about to do in the next few moments in this house. I ask you to open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our minds to discern what thus saith the word of the Lord. And I ask that you'll confirm it tonight with supernatural miracles, signs, and wonders that when we leave this place, we'll say, surely we have been in the presence of the Lord. And everybody said, would you praise God one more time? <laughs> Hallelujah. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. And Valor, don't miss tomorrow. I'm preaching a sermon tomorrow. I'm so excited about tomorrow morning service. I have a word from God. I'm excited about Valor Christian College, the school of the spirit. I thank God for every college that's raising up scientists and professors and linguistic professors and all of that. But I thank God that there is a school of the spirit right here in Columbus, Ohio, that's raising up apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers. You know why you're coming, and when you leave, you're equipped to do the ministry of the Lord. And I have a word from heaven for you tomorrow, so do not miss tomorrow's chapel service. Amen. There is a man in the Bible by the name of Lazarus who was intimately acquainted with Jesus' ministry. This isn't someone who knows Jesus from afar or isn't uh, only, uh, only as a follower of Jesus on Facebook or social media or whatever. This is someone who is intimately acquainted with this master from Galilee, so much so that when Jesus is preaching anywhere in the vicinity of Bethany, this is where Jesus sleeps. This is where Jesus rests. This is where Jesus has his sila, and this is where Jesus gets his sandwich. This is where Jesus goes to find solace to find comfort, to find friendship. It's in the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And trouble has come to Lazarus' home. Sickness and affliction has come to Lazarus, and Mary and Martha know what to do in that moment. They find their brother terminally ill. Death is imminent, and Mary and Martha know what to do. Their response is correct. They go to Jesus first. Now, it sounds elementary, yet it's very profound because it's not what most of us do. We'll go to the bank first. We'll go to the lawyer first. We'll go to home remedies first. We'll go to our philosophy first. And then when every else, every Everything else fails us, then we'll turn to Jesus. But Matthew 6, says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto thee. So they run to Jesus first, and Jesus gives them what they are seeking. They go to Jesus because they want a word. All they want is a word. And Jesus delivers what they are expecting. He says, this sickness is not unto death, but to the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now, can you imagine the joy, the exuberance? Can you imagine the happiness and the expectation that must have been in Mary and Martha's heart at receiving the word of the Lord? Because they know that the man that they're talking to is not simply a man that speaks words and then nothing comes to pass. Because they've been there when he's healed the sick. They've been there when he's raised the dead. They've been there when he has fed the the multitudes and they know that when Jesus speaks things begin to change that's why they went to find him in the first place because they know that when he speaks there is substance in his word and Jesus says this sickness is not unto death but to the glory of God so that the son of God might be glorified thereby now you can imagine the excitement that's in Mary and Martha's heart but imagine Lazarus being on a deathbed situation hasn't changed still fighting for every breath of his life but now he he has a word. This sickness is not unto death, but to the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. They have a word. They don't have any change in the condition. They don't have any difference in the moment, but they have a word. Ladies and gentlemen, you might not feel anything different yet. You might not see anything different happening in the moment. But if you have a word from God, it doesn't matter if the circumstance has changed or not changed. It doesn't matter what it looks 
looks like right now if you have a word from God you're holding on to the most valuable thing that exists in the kingdom of heaven and everything on the earth because in the beginning when there was nothing God spoke John 1 and 1 in the beginning was the word when there was nothing there was a word and a word to something out of nothing because God spoke the sun the earth the moon the creatures the beasts of the earth the beasts of the sea everything came into creation because of a word that's the power that's in a word and so now they have a hold of a word from God and it is written that a word from God cannot return void now let me help you John 1 and 1 in English says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God that's powerful that's a wonderful revelation let me help you in Spanish a little bit tonight hallelujah in Spanish it says en el principio era el verbo y el verbo era con Dios y el verbo era Dios. Now it sounds more powerful in Spanish because of all the anyways, but beyond all of the rolling of the R's and all of the extra consonants that are there, there's revelation that I would have you have tonight because of the Spirit of God. In Spanish it does not say in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. In Spanish it says in the beginning was the verb. In the beginning was the verb, and the verb was with God, and the verb was God. There's revelation, there's power there that we need to receive today. Because when God speaks, God does not simply speak nouns and pronouns and adjectives, but when God speaks, God speaks in verbs. What's a verb? A verb is an active word. It's a creative word. That's why when there was nothing, God spoke a verb and something came out of nothing because God spoke a word of creation. And so every word that comes out of the mouth of God is a verb. It's living, it's alive, and what he says must come to pass. So when God said he was gonna save your children, that's a verb. When God said he was gonna heal your body, that's a verb. When God said he would provide for your every need, that is a verb. That means it's a living word. It's a creative word. It's an active word. And what he spoke must come to pass. Would you praise God tonight? Because there's a verb in the house. Mary and Martha and Lazarus have gotten a hold of a verb. They've gotten a hold of a living word. And then he does, and you won't amen on this, Jesus gives a word and then he does what? He does nothing. And if you were being honest and weren't scared that lightning's going to fall from the sky tonight, you'd be honest and say, that frustrates me. Because I know it's not your testimony, but my testimony has been many times in my life that I have a word and then I see nothing. And it's in the nothing that my faith is truly shown. Because I can praise God when I get a word. I can praise God when he fulfills the word. But it takes a whole lot of faith to see nothing, but say, nevertheless, will I praise you. Because I don't have to see anything to trust you. I don't have to see a change to praise you. Because though there's no change in the condition, I know I have a word. And if I have a word, it shall come to pass. Give them praise in this. When I was going through the trial of my life, when the mother of my three children passed away, Pastor Sam called me. It was about 2 in the morning when we found out everything that was going on. And we're in a hospital room and we get the news of what's about to happen and the change that's about to occur in our life. And my first words weren't hallelujah anyhow. My first words were to God and I said, where are you? Because I saw you at the healing crusade. I saw you when you healed over 200 people in Orange County, but I don't see you in this hospital room. Pastor Sam called me. He said, be careful what comes out of your mouth. For you have inquired of the Lord, and you have asked, where am I? And the Lord says, where am I? He said, where was I in the fiery furnace with the three Hebrew children? Pastor Sam said, open your Bible and show me in the Bible, show me in the Word where it says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ever saw the fourth man in the fiery furnace. 
So I started looking. He said, you're taking too long. It's not there. They never saw the fourth man in the fiery furnace, but that doesn't negate the fact that the presence of the fourth man was in the fiery furnace. He said, even though they never saw the fourth man, the king saw the fourth man. Hell saw the fourth man. And I'm prophesying to someone tonight, even though you don't see God, cancer sees your God, poverty sees your God, and every demon that's been afflicting your life sees God, and they have to bow their knees at the fact that God is with you. Because I have a word. I have a word. When I first moved to Virginia Beach 16, 15 years ago, bought this little house. We're church planners. We didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of stuff. We buy a house, thought got a good deal, and then we realized, Lord Jesus, we don't have any appliances. So we had to go buy everything. We had to get every appliance for the house, including a stove, and we're running out of money. And I went somewhere to buy a stove, and I was sold on the stove because of that sales lady. That sales lady was better than that stove. I'm just being honest with you right now. She said, have you considered this stove? I said, no, that one's out of my price range. She said, but have you, see, have you seen what it can do? It had a thing on there to melt chocolate. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not bougie. I'm just telling you right now. When I want to melt my chocolate, I just put it in the microwave. But I thought it was kind of cool that now if I want to have the option to melt the chocolate, I have it on my new stove. She said, we also have a butter melter. I'm like, so this is how they live on the other side of town. All right. And she said, and above everything else, she said, you got to read the warranty. She said, for the next 30 days, you take this thing home. If you don't like it, anything goes wrong. If you just get tired of it. You just don't like melting chocolate and butter the bougie way. She said, you just return it. No questions asked. She sold me on the warranty. I said, I don't have all the money now, but based on that warranty, I mean, if I have 30 days, what's the worst that can happen? I mean, on the other side of town, if I don't have it in 30 days, I just return and get the rest of my money back. So I bought the stove, and three weeks later, I had a, I had a kitchen fire. Stove burned. That's when I lost all my weight. <laughs> stove burned. And I'm looking at my stove because I don't have any more money. And I don't know how to replace a stove. And then I started thinking, when did I buy this thing? Don't you judge me. I felt judgment coming from this side. Yes, I did. I started counting one, two, carry the six, seven, common core man. Okay. And it had only been about 19 days. So yes, I did. I called the store. I said, you know, um, it's not what I was expecting after three weeks with the stove. It's just not, uh, it's just really not what I was expecting, and uh, I'd like to get a new one. She judged me. I feel judgment. I just, ugh, who'd they bring to preach? Eh. He had a pathetic word, not a prophetic word. <laughs> and she said, well, for quality assurance, could you tell us what's wrong with the stove? I said, no, I cannot. She said, but just to help us improve. I said, yeah, see, the thing is, you'll have to ask somebody else because my warranty says no questions asked. <laughs> so three days later, these three tall dudes, granted, everybody's tall to me, okay? But these three, two, these three tall guys walk in, and they said, where's the stove? I said, it's over here. And they walked in, and they looked at that stove, and they looked at me. They looked at that stove, and they looked at me. And then it started. I can't even tell you everything they said because we're Holy Ghost filled here. <laughs> are you for real? And who do you think you are? And something about my mom and something about being Hispanic and this and that. And, this, and, and what, what, what gives you the right? And with a trembling hand, I said. <laughs> and he grabbed that paper. He said, give me that. And then it went about like this. <clears throat> oh, nah. Ah. <clears throat> nah, uh And his worker friend said, nah, mm-hmm, ah, uh. And then after about 60 seconds of grunting, those three big dudes had to pick up that oven, that stove, walk it out of my house, and three days later, they had to bring me a new stove. Now, you could say that's not fair. You can say that's not right, and that's okay that you feel that way, but I had a warranty that gave me permission to do what I did. 
You might not agree with it. They may have changed their policy afterwards, but I didn't violate my warranty. All I did was put my warranty into action. And I have met some burnt out Christians because they haven't read the warranty that says a just man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. There are some people that don't think you deserve a second chance. They don't think you ought to get a new blessing. But whatever they think really doesn't matter because if the warranty says it's yours, if the word says it's yours, it doesn't matter who doesn't agree. It doesn't matter who doesn't like it. If the word says it's yours, then it shall be yours. Give them praise in this house. So Lazarus has a word. This sickness is not unto death, but to the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Lazarus goes to a tomb, yet he still has a word from the Lord. Lazarus is on a deathbed, but he has a word from the Lord. I don't care where you go as long as you take the word with you. He went through sickness with a word. He laid on a deathbed with a word. He was embalmed with a word, and he was buried with a word. I don't care how bad this situation gets. You don't let go of a word you cling to the word you cleave to the word and after many days the Bible says Jesus said to his disciples Lazarus is sleeping let's go wake him up and the disciples not understanding that Jesus is both God and man wrapped up and robed in flesh they said master let the boy sleep he's sick and it's almost as if Jesus said my bad <laughs> talking to you like God. I'm sorry. Let, let me talk to you like a man. He's sleeping. I thank God that what looks like death to us looks like a siesta to Jesus. I thank God that what looks like a storm to everyone else just looks like peace and shalom to Jesus. I thank God that when I'm in a storm fretting that I'm about to fail, Jesus says, peace be still. And then he says, why? Were you fretting the storm? Don't you know that I am the master of Galilee and I'm also the master of the wind? And so Jesus comes to see Lazarus. Now he had been dead many days. And when Jesus shows up, Sister Mary and Sister Martha are waiting for Jesus to show up. When he comes on the scene, Nobody says, behold, he comes uh, riding on a cloud. There are no old-time Pentecostals there saying, he's an old-time God. Uh, yes, he is. Ooh, I felt that. I forgot when I'm preaching because I felt that song. May not come when you want him. Okay, anyhow, he comes walking, and Martha has a little bit of an attitude. Now, I'm not going to tell you why, but I think she's Dominican. I'll explain in just a minute. <laughs> Jesus comes on the scene, and Martha comes out. She says, you're late. <laughs> we got to hear it in Spanish. Tu estás tarde. <laughs> you understand? That's why I think she has an attitude. I'm like, ooh, Dominicana. Tu estás tarde. You're late. <laughs> so a little attitude with Jesus. She says, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus is like, you know, <laughs> I'm here. But what Martha is revealing is that because Jesus didn't do the miracle the way she wanted him to do the miracle. Because he didn't do the miracle in her timing and in her way and in her religious box of how she thinks everything is supposed to happen. She no longer can believe for the miracle. I have learned that it is possible to have faith to ask and then not have faith to receive. It's possible to have faith to bring a petition to God and then lose your faith because he doesn't do things your way. In the name of Jesus, I command you to take Jesus out of your box, take him out of your denomination, take him out of your rituals and your religion, and let God be God. Let him do it his way, however he wants, whenever he wants, and with whomever he wants to do it. So Jesus speaks the second promise to Martha. 
he says, your brother shall live again. And Martha says, oh, I know, I know. One day in the resurrection, air quotes and all, it's in there. You just got to find it. One day in the resurrection, we're all going to fly away. Oh, glory. I, I, you got to hear this, man. Oh, you say, un día en la resurrección. It's like, ooh, it's like stings a little, you know. One day in the resurrection, and Jesus is like, you know, Martha, I'm not supposed to be telling everybody yet, but I kind of am the resurrection. I mean, you, you're believing for something to happen someday, and someday is about to happen today because I just showed up. The first word of prophecy I release over this house is that there is an acceleration of time. And what you thought was going to happen someday, God sent me here as his oracle to tell you what you thought was going to happen someday is about to happen today. Before this year is over, what you thought was going to take 10 years, God says by my spirit, is going to take place this year. Because I've accelerated time, because I've stepped on the scene, resurrection power has shown up to World Harvest Church and to Valor Christian College because resurrection power is here God says I'm about to raise everything that you thought was dead I'm about to raise up everything that you called dead I'm about to raise up your marriage I'm about to raise up your money I'm about to raise up your ministry you watch as what you thought was going to take five years I'm about to do it in five months says the spirit of God I'd give him praise on that word if that's yours. I'd give him praise on that word if I was. I'd give him praise. And I'd, I'd praise him till the miracle came, till the money. I'd praise him like it's already done. So Jesus gives a third promise to Martha. I said, he's going to live again. Where have you placed him? And he said, remove the stone. And Martha says, no, 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 no. Don't do that. No. Thank you for coming. You can get chicken with the rest of the family after the service. But don't. Leave him alone. He's too dead. I know I asked you to do this work. But what I asked you to do is now impossible for you. So leave him in there. John 11 and 39, King James Version. For he stinketh. He's too dead. This is too impossible for you to do what I asked you to do. And Jesus turns around and he says, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you will see the glory of God? Your word from God isn't the problem. Your word of prophecy isn't the problem. Do you have faith that what was spoken shall come to pass? That word was given to you to activate your faith, to demonstrate your faith, to expect the miracle to take place. But between the word and the fulfillment, you got to put trust in the word. You might be one moment of trust away from seeing that miracle. You might be one confession of faith away from seeing that miracle. Jesus says, I told you you're going to see the glory of God. Lazarus! Come forth. And out of a tomb comes a man hopping. Because he's still wearing yesterday's clothing. He's alive, but he's still dressed like a dead man. There's been a change, but he still looks like what he used to be. There's been a change in his circumstance, but he's still wearing yesterday's clothing. And then God gave the last prophecy. He said, lose him and let him go because you're no longer going to be known as Lazarus the dead man from this day forward you're going to be known as Lazarus the resurrected man I'm prophesying to a Lazarus in this house today God sent me here to tell you that he's about to loose you and let you go and you're no longer going to be identified by what you came through what you lived through but how you came through you're no longer going to be known by yesterday you're going to be known by today give them praise in this house so they loosed him and they let him go 
all because of the power of a word. All because Jesus gave a word. Now I have lived, I'll be done in 10 minutes. Musicians get ready because I feel like preaching. I'll be done in 10 minutes, I think. I have lived, I have lived through hell and high water for four and a half years, almost five years now. I have buried my father. I have buried the mother of my children. I have become a single father. I have tried to navigate what's next without knowing what is next. And for the last four years, I'll be done quickly. For the last four years, every time I look, and this is why I call pastor, I said everything I said so that you would understand the power of a word. So you understand what I'm about to release in this house. For the last four years, every time I look at my phone, it's 9-11. Then I look in the evening, it's 9-11. Now, I don't want to be one of those weird Christians. I'm not hokey and I'm not kooky. But I don't believe in coincidences. I look at a license plate. It's 9-11. I'm on an airport to get on a plane to go to the next place I'm going to preach, and I look up, and it's 9-11. Or I'm on flight, 69-11. Or I go preach for a friend, and his address is 29-11. And so I don't know what it all means, but I know what 9-11 means here. So I get nervous. I start rebuking 9-11s. God, I don't know what that 9-11 is, but I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I don't know what's coming, but I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Leukemia afflicted our home. And when we went to visit with the blood doctor to understand where the leukemia had come from, the blood doctor said, there is a mutated chromosome that has attacked her body. We call it the 9-11 chromosome. Everywhere I go, there's 9-11, 9-11, 9-11. Then God starts restoring things for me. God starts doing new things for me. God starts blessing me. I was sitting right there where you in the blue shirt are sitting. I was sitting right there two years ago at camp meeting. David Crank, I wore his pants. Uh, David Crank called me out. He said, come here. He gave me a word of prophecy. He said, she's with me. But God says, this year, I'm about to give you your helpmate. This year, your kids are about to get a new mom. This year, I'm going to restore what was lost. I'm going to do this thing, the Lord says, this year. What Pastor David didn't know, we're friends, but what he didn't know is I was leaving that service to get on an airplane to fly to Michigan because I was dating Gina, quietly. Not my choice. Her, she, I was on the first date, I'm like, boo, I'm going to marry you. <laughs> and I didn't even know who's boo and who's bae yet, but I just went ahead and just went with boo. She said, you don't know my middle name. I said, when will I ever have to use your middle name, girl? <laughs> and she's like, you're crazy. I might get a restraining order to stay away. <laughs> so we're dating, but no one knows. Pastor David doesn't know. He gives me a word of prophecy. What he didn't know is I left that service to get on an airplane to fly to Michigan because Gina had lost a spouse nine years ago as well to cancer. And I was flying to Michigan to meet her first set of in-laws to tell them I love Gina and I'm going to honor Corey's memory and I'm going to help Gina raise your two kids in the admonition of the Lord. David didn't know that. I fly to Michigan And I go sit down in an Italian restaurant to meet the McCools. And Bishop McCool says, Brother Tony, do you know a fellow by the name of David Crank? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. Watch this. Because after Pastor David gave me the word, I fell out right there. Now, I was out of it, but not so out of it I was going to lose that word. I'm on the floor, but I'm texting with my hand. Brother RD, I need this video pronto right now. Before I get up, before the catchers move me. Send me this video. You don't know what this means to me. I'll give you $5 cash money. Send it now. <laughs> and when they picked me up, I was still stumbling because I still had to put, you know, I was spell checking to make sure. I, and then I'm like, whew, amen. All right, I'm good. <laughs> Bishop McCool said, do you know David Craig? I said, by a, by a matter of fact, yes, I do. Watch this. Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> and he He watched it, and then I looked at Gina. I said, Gina, thus saith the Lord. (laughs) Gina said, that's cool. I just need Jesus to say, thus saith the Lord to me too. I'm like, woman, have some faith. (laughs) He's the word of prophecy said, this year. I'm going to do this thing this year, this year, this year. 
Well, every other conversation, I don't want to say anything in case Gina's watching, so I won't mention her so that no one will know it was her. But Gina had said, if we get married, that's way down the road. But the prophet said, this year. So I showed that video, and Bishop McCool said, Brother Tony, David's my cousin. So I call Pastor David from the restaurant. I said, hey, do you know the McCools? He goes, yeah, it's my cousins. I said, the woman I want to marry is the widow from Corey McCool. And he said, Tony, before God, I didn't know, but we about to be cousins. That was July. September of last year, she agreed to marry me. But she had said, one day. But how many know that one day can become your two day? Because December the 4th, the word of prophecy became real because she and I became married and God made all things new. My problem is, hold up. Okay, I just praise him for the wedding. My problem is, I'm too much of a preacher that even at the wedding, God started speaking, and I couldn't stop the wedding and have revival. I mean, I still want to have a wedding, but God started speaking to me because as we're having our vows, and we're exchanging vows, and we're exchanging bling, and we're about to become one and all of that, I have a vision, and I see a man robed in death garments, and I see him just spinning out of what he used to be into what he's about to be, and God spoke to me at that wedding, and he said, no longer will you be known as Tony the widower, but this very day, you're known as the man that that God made all things new. I'm no longer known by what I went through. I'm known by how I came through. I'm known how God saved my children, saved Gina, saved their children, and made all things new. And God told me to tell you, he's about to do it for you. I'm coming to a close right now. Because after the wedding and God blessing and God's increasing and God's doing this and God's, in fact, oh, by the way, at that first camp meeting I came to, Pastor Parsley stood me up over there and he said, God is about to give you seven times what you lost. He's about to increase you seven times and seven this and seven that and seven this. And I'm not really good at math, ladies and gentlemen, but there's me and there's three children and I'm not about to have more babies in the name of Jesus. So I'm trying to understand how we're going to get to seven and then I met Gina and her two children, Mylon and Macy. And it occurred to me, you got Tony, Cole, Michael, Zachary, Gina, Mylon, Macy. Seven people who lived through the same situation. Seven people who lived through the valley of the shadow of death and seven people who came out on the other side. Seven people that weathered the storm and now God has made all things new. But even in this new season, I start seeing 9-11 everywhere. And every time I see it, stupid stuff happens. Can you say that? I already said it. My car's broken into. My luggage is stolen. Things happen. And I'm frustrated. I'm not superstitious. I'm not weird. But I don't like that this keeps happening to me. And one morning, about 15 days ago, I got so frustrated. I got mad. And I said, enough is enough. I said, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over the spirit of witchcraft that's on this number. I take authority over every hex, every curse that hell has designed to come my way. Everything the enemy has put on this number to try to intimidate me, to fill me with insecurity, and to try to, to, try, try to get me distracted, I bind it and I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I decree and I declare from this day forward, 9-11 doesn't mean a storm from hell. It means a storm from heaven. I decree this very day 
today that when I see 9-11, good things are going to happen to me. Blessing is coming my way. Money is coming my way. Increase is coming my way. I declare from this day forward, every time I see that number, goodness and mercy, provision and abundance and prosperity is on its way. Somebody shout that very day. That very day that I prayed that prayer, before it was 12 p.m. Eastern, every dollar that is owed to me personally, every dollar that's owed to our ministry, everything that was lacking was paid for, and every dollar owed was paid supernaturally within hours to the ministry. Within hours, I became debt-free. Within hours, the ministry was debt-free. So you want to know why I'm here tonight? Because God told me in the ninth month of 2019, he said, I'm about to command a financial blessing to come upon World Harvest Church. I'm about to cancel their debt, and I'm about to supernaturally bring everything that belongs to them back in the storehouse. And he said, I don't need three years. I need three days in a tomb. I need three minutes of praise. I need the next... I wish you'd praise him like that's your word tonight. I wish you'd praise him like he's about to bring you out and give you everything that belongs to you. Hey, stay standing because it'll help me come to a close. I called three friends that day. I called Pastor Jonathan Miller. I said, Jonathan, God has given me a word of prophecy. There's a thing called a 9-11 blessing. I said, God just spoke to my heart to call you and to tell you that in the ninth month of 2019, God is about to reallocate misappropriated funds and he's about to put the money back in your church. God's about to give you back what belongs to you. He said, Tony, you got to come preach the word. I said, I don't have any dates available to come in September. He said, Tony, look at what next Wednesday is. It was 9-11. He said, you're going to come on 9-11 and release the 9-11 word. So I went to Orlando last week and I released the 9-11 word for the first time. From that night till this week, God has supernaturally brought people out of debt. God has supernaturally restored things that were lost. And God has put an acceleration on the return of a seed. My mother, my mother is a missionary. My mother is about to venture into something new. And somebody gave my mother $1,000. And she needs 10000 to do what she's about to do. Somebody gave my mother $1,000. And then my brother, who pastors the church where she is, had a missionary. And she said, Tony, I felt like I had to give $1,000. She said, and the next day, my glasses broke, the brakes went out on the car, and now I need $1,000. Before we hung up the phone, somebody supernaturally sent my mother $1,000. And then the person that sent my mother the $1,000 had a miracle happen within three days. They had sold a house a year ago, and the bank called and said, oh, by the way, we forgot to refund what was in the escrow account. We have a $1,000 check waiting for you at the bank. Because there's an acceleration on the ninth month for God to supernaturally bless your finances. Now, I have a word. And then the Lord said, call Pastor Parsley. Now you have to understand my respect for that man of God and the general that he is. I would never take it upon myself to feel like I have a word of prophecy for Pastor Rod Parsley. Never in my life would it cross my mind to say, Pastor, thus saith the Lord. So I said to Jonathan, and I said to God, I told Jonathan, I said, I don't dare call him. I feel like I'm supposed to, but I don't dare call him. I said, God's going to have to really speak clearly if he wants me to call Pastor Parsley. 
And Jonathan said, yeah, we're just talking. And I looked at my phone. It's 9-11. I said, I got to hang up. I got to call Pastor Parsley right now. So I called him with the word, and I released that word. There's a supernatural acceleration of time to cancel debt, to get back everything that's lost, and to bring people out of debt this month. There's an, there's an anointing on this month, this month. In this week, every church I've preached at is called Harvest. That's not an accident, ladies and gentlemen. But I don't, I still didn't understand the word. I mean, I have, I'm pre prophesying a 9-11 blessing, and I don't know what it means. And last week, I'm in Mississippi, and the Lord stops me on the side of the road, and he says, now I'm going to show you the word. The number nine means completion, finality, the end. That's what the number nine means. Completion, finality, the end. The number 11 stands for disorder, chaos, and rebellion. He said, you go to World Harvest Church and you prophesy to the body of Christ that in the ninth month of 2019, I'm bringing an end, I'm bringing closure to disorder, to chaos, and to rebellion. I'm bringing a closure to chaos, and I'm bringing a finality to failure. You let them know that I have commanded a 9-11 blessing to come upon this season for the body of Christ, and if they'll sow it, and if they'll trust it, I'll supernaturally cancel their debt I'll bring them out and oh by the way he said you won't have to fight for it you won't have to look for it because he said blessing is about to find you When David lost it all, lost the palace, lost his friends, lost his family, lost his money, when he lost everything, he hid in a cave, but he had a praise. If you can sing in the rain, then you can sing in a cave. He had a praise. He's in the cave, he said. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. In the cave, he said, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And while he was praising God in a cave, you know who walked into the cave? His daddy walked into the cave. His brothers walked into the cave. The mighty men of Israel walked into that cave. David didn't have to seek them out. They found him. And I prophesy to you today that God's about to command blessing to come your way that you won't have to seek out you won't have to find it it's gonna find you it's gonna come to your house it's gonna come to your bank account it's about to come to your mirror I wish you'd praise him like you believe it today